here back on this zero hour. I am your host, Richard R.J. Escal. A lot of people in this country don't know this, but there was a very important strike in India over the past week. And here to discuss that and perhaps related matters as well with us now is Richard Wolf. As you know, if you're a regular listener or viewer of this program, Richard Wolf is an economist. He is a professor at several universities, or at least two that I can think of. He is the host of Economic Update Tuesday evenings on Free Speech TV. And his latest book, which we discussed a couple of weeks ago, is entitled The Sickness is the System. So without any further ado, Richard Wolf, thanks for coming back on the program. Uh, thank you, RJ. Glad to be here. I feel as if the India strike, uh, now maybe I'm just uh, overly conspiratorial by nature, but I feel that somehow it, it, it vanished or, or never appeared uh, in any headlines that I saw. I got very little coverage in this country. And perhaps in my mind, that's because of the, the corporate media in this country uh, tends to uh, minimize uh, global reporting, for, for one thing, reporting from other parts of the country, especially those parts that have been uh, rather condescendingly, condescendingly referred to in the past as the third world. We used to say non-aligned many years ago, number one, and number two, labor news doesn't get, the, in my view, the coverage it should. But in any case, I feel it's an undercovered and important story, and I was very interested in your thoughts on it. Well, I could not agree more, both with uh, your comment about it's underreported and also why that might be. Um, I do think there is that bias. It has been there for basically all my adult life. Um, it tends to report on other countries almost like you would instruct children with simple morality plays, uh, the good guys and the bad guys. The good guys look an awful lot like us and like us and we like them. And the bad guys are people who are different or critical uh, of the way things the United States does. So let me talk about what happened in India. First of all, it's absolutely historic. It was a general strike. Most of the trade unions uh, representing workers combined and worked together to produce it even more remarkable, they got together with a group of farmers organization. And remember, India remains a very significantly agricultural nation. Uh, and so they got the farmers organizations together with most of the labor unions. In fact, the only labor union that did not participate is the one aligned with the government uh, run by Mr. Modi. Uh, so it's a general strike, and it included, and this is the, the number that makes it historic, 250 million people. That is, by itself, astounding. Uh, to give you an idea, that's a number equal to three quarters of the population of the United States. Uh, it is a task of monumental organization. It couldn't possibly be done without strong, well-organized uh, operations across India, which is a very large, diverse country. And it couldn't have happened without enormous sympathy and ideological agreement uh, among uh, the people of India uh, about what the strike was focused on. And here are some of the issues. The Modi government is like the Trump government and is like the Bolsonaro government in Brazil. It has turned to nationalism. Its whole approach has been to divert the public's attention from the deteriorating economy and the fact that in a deteriorating economy, more and more of scarce resources are going to the super rich at the top, and the burden of the decline is shifted on to the mass of people. This is so dangerous for the capitalist system, this kind of separation, division in society, 
that it becomes very urgent to focus the mass of people's upset about what's happening to them on something other than the economic system. So uh, Mr. Trump got us angry at immigrants. Mr. Trump got us angry at foreign trading partners like China or Europe or Mexico or Canada, whoever he could think of, the foreigner, the other, the immigrant, in hopes of getting people's, um, how shall I put it politely, baser instincts to focus them elsewhere. That's what the uh, white supremacy was about. That's what the misogyny was about. In India, it's a different country, so they played their nationalism, <coughs> excuse me, a little differently. There, the thing to rev up, which Mr. Modi did, was the antipathy between the Hindu majority and the Muslim uh, minority, to re revive all of those terrible parts of the history of that area, uh, of the British colonial regime playing the Hindu people against the Muslim people, and all of that. So he became a Hindu nationalist, attacking Muslims, looking the other way, becoming famous because he condoned uh, unspeakable crimes against the Islamic uh, minority. So he could rev that, get people all excited about their religious differences so they don't ask why they their economic system is in such trouble. You know, Mr. Bolsonaro does it with his antics, his militarism, his saber rattling in Latin America, and his copycat uh, approach to COVID uh, the way he does with Trump. So it is very important that at least in one of these countries, in this case India, the mass of people saw through it, weren't distracted and mobilized enough to produce a general strike of 250 million people against the economic policies of the Modi government. That was made crystal clear. There were demands as part of this strike for pensions for people that don't have them, approving pensions for those who do have them. Uh, cash support during the COVID, which is desperately uh, bad in India, uh, all kinds of demands on the government to do what it isn't doing and should be for the mass of people, at the same time undoing the quote-unquote reforms. By the way, nowadays the word reform has become the go-to terminology to disguise a reduction in support for people. You dare not say Absolutely. what you're doing. So it's all about reform. But nobody in India was fooled. So the reason it's historic is that this has rarely been done in India. It has rarely been possible to get all the unions together. It has rarely been possible to get all the farmers together. It has been rarely impossible to get the two groups together and to focus them against a sitting government that has tried everything it could think of to prevent this, including really ugly police repression, it did not work. And, and what is being done in India is, it may not be covered, but the awareness of it will seep into Brazil, it will seep into other countries, the few that have gone in this direction. And even here in the United States, where the coverage was stunning by its silence, uh, it's going to be standing there as a kind of notion for the working class in the United States to ask itself an, an obvious question. We've just had four years of among the worst anti-labor, anti-working class governments in our history, and the labor movement mounted no opposition. They, the labor movement in the United States was itself so divided by the Trump administration. So many were distracted into being angry at immigrants or China or something else that we weren't able to do what the Indians have now shown us how to do. And I think that lesson will not be lost on Americans either.
And Richard Wolf, there are so many directions I, I could. Uh, I'd love to take this conversation, but I'll start with this one. I was actually I spent some time in India quite a while ago now, about thirty years ago, and uh, uh, it was a study. But I was asked to cooperate with uh, the IMF, uh, or at least be in touch with them while I was there. And it's you mentioned reform. Uh, I'm putting air quotes around it for people who are listening on radio. Reform meaning reduction in services that help people, which has been a longstanding agenda. So two thoughts, whether it's Trump in the United States or Modi in India, it seems to me that uh, this the hatred and viciousness they represent may be the, the bloody, you know, the fangs of a system that even under the most genteel of uh, governments there, and for that matter here for many decades, has sort of represented a global, as you well know, a global financial system that is inhumane. So the extent to which uh, people in workers in India are able, were able to mobilize that against that is tremendous. And I think that just as the global financial elites are affecting workers around the world, my hope is, and you spoke to this already, is that workers around the world can teach each other and guide each other in ways to resist these forces. And I'm hoping there will be a way to transmit these, uh, the lessons of, uh, of, if you do know India, uh, the remarkable level of organization across the geography and the differences in language and culture and uh, everything else, uh, to make this happen. Uh, so I find it a very hopeful sign. Have there been any, uh, either within India that you're aware of or globally, any repercussions, uh, reactions we should know about either from uh, the forces from above or uh, the solidarity forces among workers themselves? There've been several things that I think are noteworthy. One, uh, there were incidents leading up to the demonstration and during the general strike of overreaction by the police, unnecessary and excessive violence from the police. This was widely reported and I think had the opposite effect of what the government intended. Uh, that often happens. It provoked, it radicalized, it stimulated the mass of people to see how desperate the government was at, mm -hmm. at something very peaceful, very well organized, uh, threatening only the power structure that runs the society, uh, and still it could not react, except in the way that the Indians often associate with the British colonial regime uh, of using violence uh, as a way to try to control a population. So that was one thing that came out of it. But the biggest thing, I think, and it did get a lot of publicity, at least in Asia and parts of Europe, uh, is it as an example. You're absolutely right. Uh, the general strike pulled off under these circumstances is an enormous pushback against the Modi government. And my guess is that they will now retreat. Uh, for example, um, you had something that didn't get much more attention. You had a remarkable move by the Macron government in France also over the last few weeks to try to water down and change the law to protect police from being captured in doing illegal things, particularly violence against protesters, something that has come up over the last two years um, in response to the famous Yellow Vest movement in that country. And so the government was doing something uh, pro-police. Well, the demonstrations in France went crazy. I mean, you had whole areas of, of uh, Paris, the, 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 the capital, blocked by millions. I don't know if it was literally millions, but at the very least, hundreds of thousands of, of, of demonstrators saying, no, we're not going to let the country function if you do this kind of thing, you can't do it. And within 24 hours, that part of the proposal was withdrawn 
by the government. Now they're talking about rewriting it and uh, to address the people's concerns. But it's a defeat for the government. It's an embarrassment. Mm -hmm. They had to withdraw it. And comparable things, I suspect, will be coming from Macron. And I think you're seeing it in a third part of the world. I'm not saying that they were all coordinated. They weren't. But they were inspired is the word I want. I think you're seeing inspiration also uh, coming from the women in Poland. Uh, when the government there went even further than it had in the past um, in banning abortion, um, the, pe the, the people of Poland, uh, led by the women of Poland, said no and have gone into the streets uh, against the police, against a repressive government, um, and they're winning basically that struggle, both at home and abroad. Uh, the, the inspiration uh, that has been given you know, it's very interesting here for the United States, where you now have a conservative Supreme Court that may, in fact, go even to the point of undoing Roe versus Wade, uh, reinstituting the uh, ban on abortion. And I think if you see that, you will see actions in the United States, which even by the people involved, will they won't know, but in fact, they'll have in their heads the recent headlines about Poland. So I think these events, Poland, France, and above all, the general strike in India, are signs of a changing level of popular militancy and popular demand for political change. Uh, I guess my last question for you is, and I want to be sensitive to your time, so whenever you have to go, please just... Tell me, and now I have to go. But uh, my last question for you has to do with, in terms of global labor trends, uh, and your point about uh, reactions in general is well taken, but, uh, and, and the re reactions that, for example, repealing uh, Roe versus Wade might trigger. But in terms of labor, it seems to me a country like France uh, has m a strong tradition of labor action, of strikes, of labor solidarity, um, India, uh, you know, is not the United States. It has a, in this country, we have uh, at least three quarters of a century of reaction against labor stri strength, uh, dissolution, a uh, dissolution, I should make sure my pronunciation is clear, of a, a, an undermining of uh, the rights of labor, uh, erosion of uh, dra drastic erosion of labor membership and so on as well as kind of a pushing of a warped cultural view that says somehow uh, a rentier or investor in a corporation has the right to deny uh, uh, reproductive care to employees, you know, Hobby Lobby or whatever, but a worker does not have a right to withhold her labor uh, uh, for, uh, let's say, if her company decides to manufacture munitions or what have you. So we have, a, in my view, an inverse view of who should have the rights to determine uh, how their uh, energy is, or capabilities are used. Um, are we behind the eight ball compared to most other countries on this? And if so, I'm sure it's a topic for a whole other conversation, but uh, we, you know, thoughts on reversing that. Yes, I think what we're seeing is a kind of historical shift. Every one of the examples I gave, France, Poland, and India, tried desperately to avoid their people being angry at the capitalist system that governs in their society by focusing in, instead on religious or racial or national origin differences. Look at Macron nakedly uh, pandering to the anti-Islamic uh, predilections of the, of the French people based on their horrible history of exploiting uh, North Africa as a colony, uh, India against the Muslims, Trump against immigrants. and It's amazing the, 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 this overlap between uh, saving capitalism and resorting to the kind of anti foreigner that has so often tempted capitalism's in trouble. What I'm seeing, though, and what I want people to think about is that there is something now rearing its head and saying no. There is a delayed 
reaction. Mr. Modi has been in power for years. Mr. Macron or policies like him, his have been in power for years and ditto, uh, in, in, you know, in Poland. And yet what we're seeing now are real powerful mass oppositions, much stronger than the people in power expected, much stronger than their efforts to repress uh, could manage. And that gives me hope. Yes, the United States has, in its own peculiar history, more obstacles to overcome uh, than those other countries, to tell you the truth. But I don't think it's fundamentally different. I never did. So my guess is what we're seeing now in India, France, and Poland is on its way here and will be perhaps a surprise to the new Biden administration. But had they been paying attention to the dynamic of what's going on, they shouldn't be as surprised as I expect them likely to be. And I have a theory that should a massive labor in action in this country threaten the stock portfolios of uh, right-wing judges and centrist elected officials alike, uh, we might find after a certain period of time far more, far more flexibility in their positions than we might have imagined. At least that's my hope. Yes, uh, that, I think it, it's been my hope, but for the first time in a while, uh, that strike in India, its strength, its sophistication, its elegance, its organization, those speak volumes, as do the, the women leading those demonstrations uh, in Warsaw and in Poland, and the people, the Yellow Vests and the others in France. These are unified left-wing mobilizations of enormous self-confidence and effectivity, and that cannot be denied and is a new element changing the dynamic we're living through. Global workers uprising coming soon to a country near you. That is uh, my hope for 2021, and I know it's yours. Richard Wolf, economist, professor, and host of Economic Update. As always, I learned a great deal, and as always, thank you so much for coming on the program. Thank you, RJ, and I look forward to our next uh, continuation. As do I. And we'll continue right after this. I am Richard R.J. Escow, and you're listening to The Zero Hour.